Jerusalemos. Hello everybody, happy Tuesday and welcome to episode 14, 14 of Curious Case Files. I'm Lisa. I'm Jamie. Hello. I'm, Dan I'm Danielle. <coughs> and uh, this week we've got quite a tough one for you. Now, uh, disclaimer, I have looked at a lot of true crime cases over the years and this is one of the most horrific. It is, it's not nice. Mm -hmm. It's not very nice what happened to this girl and uh, just brace yourself. Uh, it's one of the worst. It really is. Yeah. I know we said like the other week, uh, and, and again, not putting down the severity of the other ones, but uh, this is a whole new level, to be honest. Yeah. This, I mean, until you hear this, it, it's just unimaginable. It's definitely got some um, very disturbing content that it's so inhumane, but uh, it needs to be told. It needs to get, I mean, she deserves her story to be told so yeah it's her legacy it's her legacy yeah uh, mm -hmm. what happened to her was truly horrific and uh, we're going to get into the details of that and it's not nice but uh, it's something that doesn't need to happen again and maybe by talking about it uh, it'll make people pay a little bit more attention to what's going on with the children uh, and it's going to be a tough one to get through that's why we Took a little break last week and done the spring break because we, it was Easter and there was like birthdays, anniversaries, yeah. and we needed to put the time into this one to give her the attention that it deserved to make sure we got all the details mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. uh, her name is was Suzanne Capper, and she tragically lost her life at the age of sixteen. Yeah. And uh, have you noticed we're all in a row? Just <laughs> We're all on the equal level, right? We've got Jamie in the middle. Ja Jamie didn't want to be in the middle. He felt like he was on display, but uh, I told him it had to be boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl, so he's in the middle. So that's me in the middle. It's you in the middle. It works. I've been playing with the settings, and I've got us all in a row. I like it. And I've also uh, done this. So the picture is above us, look. Or we can have it uh, to the side. A Jamie, Jamie sandwich. sandwich. Yes. <laughs> Very but similar yeah, to that. Yeah, Jamie said he was in a woman's sandwich earlier, yeah. but it sounded a bit wrong and weird. Weird. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I suppose they, everybody's waiting to hear what this is all about. Just brace yourselves, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 
we'll it's get not, down to it. Not pretty, and it's going to be difficult to actually for us to talk about it. Uh, so I can imagine it's going to be difficult to hear as well, especially if you've never heard of this case before, which is quite likely, even in the UK, this happened in 1990s, and the media didn't give it very much attention at all. Mm -hmm. uh, it, is, it is said that it wasn't given the attention because it was overshadowed by another big case in the UK that was the murder of a toddler uh, called Jamie Bulger, which is something that we'll maybe cover later. But that happened two months later. There's no excuse for why yeah. the media didn't give this the attention it deserved. I, I mm -hmm. think if it had more attention, there'd be more uproar of what you hear. You know, there'd, be more, the, there'd be a lot yeah. more uproar, uh, especially... <laughs> Yeah, right. What you'll find out later. Yeah. <laughs> Without giving anything away. So this is the murder of Suzanne Capper. And to begin, I believe the very first picture is her as a child. Uh, I should say about maybe four or five there. Yeah, I would guess. Maybe didn't say, I didn't say what age she was in this. Now, that was something I noticed in research in this case. There is a, a lack a lack of photos of Suzanne, which I yeah. find quite sad, really. That it, is, it is sad. Yeah, it is, a, it is a UK case. It happened in Manchester, yeah. uh, which we'll get into. And it should have been reported everywhere. I mean, it should, yeah. it should have been heard of, but some, for some reason. This is, this is her when she was four or five, I would say, there. And this is her roughly about 15, 16. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we'll leave her on the screen while we tell you a little bit about Suzanne mm -hmm. Jane Capper. Suzanne Jane Capper was born in Greater Manchester in England on September the 1st, 1976. Suzanne and her older sister Michelle were both raised by her mother. And uh, I'm using the term raised very loosely here, but you'll get to later. Just putting that out there. Her mother, Elizabeth Dunbar, uh, she didn't know who her father was, apparently. Uh, some sources say that the father just didn't have any contact, but apparently, uh, according to friends, people that know the situation, she never knew where, where her real father was. In her early childhood, her mother apparently had several relationships with different men, so it was a bit hectic, different people in and out of the house. And But uh, she met, eventually, a man called John Capper, and the girls, uh, Suzanne and Michelle, finally had some stability in their lives and some caring from a supportive father figure. Yeah. However, in 1990, when Suzanne turned 14, her mother and John Capper unfortunately parted ways and split up. This obviously caused some turmoil in the lives of the two girls, uh, because for all intents and purposes, he was the only father that they had ever really known. And despite not being their biological father, he still met, remained a constant in their lives even after this. Even after he split up from the mother, he's only their stepfather, but he still remained a constant. And we mm -hmm. cared about uh, these girls. And he tried his best, despite not being a legal parent, he tried his best. <clears throat> this milestone, however, the separation of her mother and her stepfather... <clears throat> So her and her sister end up in what I can only describe as a very bizarre situation where they were staying in multiple homes. Uh, sometimes they were with their mother, sometimes they were staying with John, but they were also frequenting the homes of friends. And as a result, the local authority at one stage became involved and the two girls both spent some time in the care system uh, before being returned to their mother. Which uh, we know that works may or may not have been a mistake. I don't mm. know. Come for me. Uh, <clears throat> XB asked, uh, "What year was this?" This was nineteen ninety two. It was nineteen ninety two. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've we've started from like when she was born in nineteen seventy six. We went up to nineteen ninety when she was fourteen in the split. We're going to get to the events that actually happened. The main part of today's case happened in nineteen ninety two. Yeah. So um, Suzanne was described as a sort of polite, friendly girl. She always remembered her please and um, thank yous. She would do anything for her, anyone. And she was generally eager to please, um, which unfortunately probably um, was the reason why she got manipulated by the people that would uh, go on to take her life, as we're going to tell you in the most uh, heinous of ways and disgusting of ways, as again, you will we'll learn, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, so brace yourself. Um, 
this young girl, I mean, she just wanted friendship, really, and stability. You know, she didn't have a home. She wanted a, to a belong. Stable home. She? she wanted to belong. Mm -hmm. um, a place where she can call home, friends that she can call friends. And uh, unfortunately, the place where she ended up was so far removed from that idea and the polar opposite of what she was actually seeking, unfortunately. And uh, I, I know it's terrible. It's terrible to think about. And, and people have, have sort of been there, you know, um, there's a lot of people who, who go through these sort of transitions and uh, unfortunately uh, she was she felt trapped there as we'll find out mm -hmm. and before we move on um just get the next picture up just to show you i'm um, just assuming danielle told me to give you a map because i just assume everybody knows where manchester is because i'm in the uk but <laughs> danielle doesn't have a clue. So i'm going to show you a little map just in case you've not got a clue just to Let's see where we were where we're talking about in the uk yeah. This little red dot here, that is Manchester in the UK. This has only got England on it. Uh, for some reason, they've chopped the best bit off and Scotland's not there, but I don't care. Whatever. <laughs> that's where Manchester is. So that's where the events of today's case yeah. take place. And uh, I don't know why it's went to the side, because I made it to it. It should be on the <laughs> There we go. There we that's go. Right. They, get the, they get the idea. So, yeah, this took place over in Manchester, and I needed the visual because... I don't know all these yeah, I was being selfish. I just assumed oh, it's only everybody it's knows where Manchester is, just because I know. <laughs> I'm really so wrong gonna... with geography, though. Yeah. So the fact that I know, I just assumed everybody knows. Yeah. So we're going to move along closer to when this actually happened, um, which, you know, leads us to the whole story of Suzanne herself. And at the age of 16, um, this took her to be involved with Jean Powell and the home of Jean Powell, a 26 year old mother of three. Suzanne had been introduced to Powell around the age of 10 after Powell's younger brother, Clifford Hayes, who's also nicknamed Pook, which will come in play here. What? I just want to stop you really quickly, Daniel, and explain to people, this is going to get confusing. There is six, six. I'm oh, Scottish, six I'm, not, I'm not saying bad words, six, six. the number six. six. There's Six perpetrators. Perpetrators in this case. And it's very it's going to be very confusing, the relationships between the six perpetrators. So I'm going to now put on screen. I don't like putting the pictures of the person that's committed the crime on screen. But for this case, I'm going to leave them on the screen while Daniel explains this to you so you can see where they are and get a visual idea of the relationships between everybody. Yeah. It's very, it, might, it might be difficult to keep up. And there is a point later where I'll put them back on the screen just so you know who we're talking about. Yeah. So as she puts them on the screen here, you'll see that um, that's Jean Powell in the upper left. The, and she was a 26-year-old mother of three. And as I stated a moment ago, um, her younger brother, Clifford Hayes, who was also known as Pook, um, he was the one who kind of introduced Suzanne to Powell when they met when they were younger, um, at around the age of 10. Now, some sources say that um, Suzanne might have babies or been babysat by Jean Powell when she was younger as well, but we have no confirmation of that. So we're just going to go stick to what we did find out in regards to um, Pook introducing her um, to her. So Powell, she lived in a terrace house, which I had to ask what a terrace house is for those <laughs> Americans. It's a row of homes that are right next to each other. They, they're, there's no separation. It almost looks like an apartment building in my in i guess that's how i would equate it so they call those terraced homes over there you've got like you've got terrace you've got an end terrace which is only attached to one house and then when you've got one that's not attached that's called a detached house or and a semi-detached semi house <laughs> so this one was actually um a terraced house and the address was 97 langworthy road and it was just a half a mile from where suzanne's stepfather lived and where suzanne and her sister michelle lived with him for a time as well and as a teenager, um, Suzanne began babysitting Powell's children, which she did for free. Again, she just wanted approval from people. She wanted friendship. She wanted to be accepted. And she liked to do things for other people. Yeah. And this this led her um, to her often staying the night at Powell's house and skipping school the following day because she had been there, stayed all night or, or what have you. Mm -hmm. um, at the age of 14, Suzanne found herself basically doing what they say couch surfing so bouncing around you know back and forth different places not just living at her stepdad's house but moving around so she was couch surfing and then she had inadvertently ended up often staying at Jean Powell's home more frequently 
-hmm. So Suzanne, this 14 year old girl who was looking for stability, unfortunately it was in the wrong place. Um, she saw Powell as a friend, but also probably looked up to her as a mother figure because her mother chose to not be a part of their lives. Um, or not very often anyway, not somebody that she could look to. Yeah. Mm. I think still kept in touch, but it wasn't. It was a bizarre, rela I don't, a bizarre I don't relationship. relationship. We'll get to that later. I don't even understand what was going on with the mother. So Jean, Jean Powell didn't really have that same idea, obviously, on her in her relationship with Suzanne. She saw a vulnerable child whom she could manipulate to do her bidding, take advantage of, obviously. And she convinced um, Suzanne... Um, who, you know, Suzanne was already babysitting the kids for free, but uh, Powell wasn't satisfied with that. And she convinced Suzanne to stop going to school and take up a cleaning job at a local construction company. And then she kept Suzanne's wages. As she did, yeah. And, you know, Suzanne was probably grateful for the roof over her head. Probably, you know, it's like she had to earn her keep, maybe is how she viewed it herself. Yeah. And she was desperate for acceptance and friendship from this older woman. So she did it willingly. Slowly, Suzanne became more like a slave though. And more of a slave than a friend or even a house guest. And she was now not going to school and working a job to give all the money to Jean, as well as looking after Jean's kids for free still and doing all of the housework. Yeah. So it just wasn't a good setup. And I think we have a picture right, of don't labor anyone. No, when we, when we say uh, housework, um, yeah, that, that was probably doing all the crappy work because the actual place was in a bit of a disarray, as you'll find out later as well. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. just for the Americans, I'm not going to be selfish. This is the actual row of houses uh, that was taken by the media, I believe, after the yeah. event of today's case. This has got a uh, Jean Powell's house and somebody else's house, which we'll get to in a minute. But just to show you what this terrace house is like, these are all different houses. Every yeah. you've got like loads of little front. We live in a terrace house. Uh, they look deceptively small on the outside than they are inside. They're actually quite spacious. But but yeah. this is the actual. This is the actual um, strip of homes that this took place at. This is yeah. Uh, yeah. the scene of the crime, so to speak. Yeah. And. Uh, I believe Jamie's now going to tell you about Bernadette. Yeah, I don't know if you want to put those images back up there and so I they can probably, see who they are. I probably should. And uh, just, I'm getting used to my new setup. <laughs> right, so we've went over the top Jane. left, Jane, and the bottom left, that's uh, Pook, the Pook. brother. Clifford, a.k.a. Pook. You've got to tell about Bernadette. Am I? Yeah. Yes, you are. Oh. It's me. It's me. <laughs> I'm so confused. It's me. I'm going to tell you about Bernadette and what a lovely human being Bernadette is. So, uh, yeah. In the middle, on the bottom row, that thing in the middle, that's Bernadette, everybody. Mm -hmm. but, but just all together here, just before I could uh, look at them. You know, she looks the most harmless out of, if you, if you want to say normal. I mean, she's got a nice smile, but I mean, we're going to find out that she was probably one of the worst of all of them, but no, they look like just a bunch of reprobates to me. But that's just my opinion. Don't come for me. That's my opinion. No, anyway. they they don't look. They're definitely a weird old bunch. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Bernadette McNeely lived at number ninety-one Longworthy Road, and uh, as we have already told you, Jean was at number ninety-seven. Now I don't know how it works in America when numbering your houses because you've got houses that are like. 1,363, which is weird to us, but uh, on one side of the road you'll have the odd numbers, on the other side you've got the even numbers, so you'd go 91, 93, 95, 97. So it was four houses apart, which in a lot of space, considering that they're terraced houses, and you've just seen yeah. the picture. So four houses away, we've got Bernadette. Lovely street, I'm glad I didn't live there. Anyway, you find out why it's lovely, considering that these people lived in it. Anyway, Bernadette also had three children, and at some point, she moved in to Jean's house. <laughs> yeah. So she went from number 91 to number 97. She weren't close enough for some With, with wow. her own three children. Her and her three kids had moved into Jean's house. So you've got Jane 
and Jean's three kids. <laughs> You've got Bernadette and her three kids. You've got Suzanne. Now, at one point, Michelle, Suzanne's older sister, lived there, but apparently she moved out when Bernadette moved in because she thought, yeah, don't that's like enough. Her. Yeah. yeah. She yeah. had a well, bit of feeling about Bernadette. And she, but, she, uh, she conveyed that to Suzanne at some point, too. But Suzanne's a 16 year old, and you know, what are you going to yeah. do? So, Bernadette, despite having a house just yards away, and my hands going into Jamie's screen because yeah. I'm just that close. Yeah, it was that close. That was how close she was, right? She moved four doors up to move in with Jane. So you've got six kids in this house as well. So Suzanne's sister is for oh, Bernadette's here. No, because she didn't have a very good reputation, apparently. She was a bit of a bitch. So I've, <laughs> yeah, apparently so, so I've read. Apparently there was one story, I can't actually confirm this, but one person said that she'd threatened to burn her house down. She didn't burn her house down, but she set fire to her washing line in the back garden. But she's lovely. She's a lovely human being. But Suzanne decided, decided to stay. And now she was free childcare to six children instead of three. And she was being treated by a, like a slave by More these two one. women. Mm -hmm. These two grown women, one's 24 and one's 26, mm -hmm. are treating her like a slave. Um, Paul and McNeely were twisted, damaged, vengeful human beings. And I use the term human beings very loosely because there's no humanity in these people. Uh, and now together, apart, they were bad enough. Separately, they were just evil. Yeah. Together, it was a whole <clears throat> new level of evil. And Suzanne, or I'm sorry, Bernadette was also known to be addicted to drugs and on yeah. drugs often. So no, they, were, they were all on drugs as well. Just, all yeah. yeah. Drugs as well yeah. Yeah. Just to yeah. add more crap to it. Yeah, they were all on drugs. Anywho. This environment, because I'm going to call it an environment, because it was by no stretch of anybody's imagination a home. Right. Uh, was chaotic and it was horrendous. The house was basically a drug den. Uh, they were not only taking drugs, they were selling drugs from this property. And basically, if you think of a slum, like the most slummy place that you could think of, that doesn't even begin to describe number 97 Langworthy Road. The living room, uh, do you call that a living room in America or is it lounge? No, it's, 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 it's a living room. Living room. room. living room. The living room didn't have any actual sofas. They were sitting on the removed seats from stolen cars. <laughs> so you just had random car seats splattered yeah. around the living room. Yeah, not, not baby car seats. No, actual the adult car like seats driver seat, seat, yes. seat yeah. maybe, um, maybe the back seats as well for the sofa. Who yeah. knows? Yeah. Lined up. Oh, I don't know. So, yeah, you can imagine the state of this house. There's probably drugs everywhere. It's just filthy. Uh, and you've got six, cho six children. And I, I didn't actually, I couldn't find the ages of these children. But if you imagine that uh, one of them is 24 and one of them is 26, I'm imagining that every, uh, it must be that at least there were 16. I would hope that there were 16 before they started giving birth to these children. So all of these six children are under the age of 10. I would imagine so because they needed a babysitter. Yeah. yeah. So they're all under the age of 10. Like mm -hmm. squatters. Yeah. Like squatters. That's how they were living yeah. pretty, pretty much. And people were squatting there, weren't they? When we Basically, about, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah. You've got the removed, removed stolen car seats in the living room uh, drugs in the kitchen because apparently uh, jean powell actually facilitated people in the area stole cars and then took them to jean powell who facilitated the sale of the cars or the deconstruction that's probably not the word but uh, there's probably a proper word for it of the cars to sell dismantling all the cars. And... dismantling of the cars yeah. to sell the parts and whatever mm -hmm. so she was obviously quite into the crime community that yeah. she was that as a woman had to that position. You didn't normally hear of that sort of That's thing. The, yeah. Women, Anywho, and you please, throughout this whole case, do not forget that there are six young children living in this house. And we've got already these people living in this house. You've got Bernadette, Suzanne, Jane, six kids. But that's not it. Oh, nine and it's only a little terrace house. But that, no, there's more. There's we'll more. Get, we'll, yeah, we'll get into that. Yeah. There is, and, and you probably noticed that there's pictures above that we've not discussed yet. But there is more people living in this shithole. Yeah. Now then. Jamie's going to tell you about two of them. 
Yeah, the other frequent um, squatters. We'll use the word squatters because that's, yeah, that's a very good word, squatters. Um, there's two other boys, males. Um, one was Anthony Dudson, and the other was Jeffrey Lee. Now, on the picture, Anthony Dudson is center on the top row, and Jeffrey Lee is bottom right. Okay. Right. Yeah. Judson was um, 16 years old at the time of the incident. Mm. Right? Oh, yeah. And, of course, as I just said, he was a frequent uh, visitor to the house and often stayed over because, are you ready for this? He I don't was... think anybody's ready for this. No. He was in a relationship with Jean Powell. She's 26. Yeah. Who was 26. Um, but that's not all, folks. He was also sleeping with Bernadette McNeely. Yes, Bernadette as well, who was 24 at the time. Mm -hmm. Keeping uh, it all close, huh? Disgusting. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's pure speculation, but I should imagine that the relationship, you know, all this didn't happen in a year. Like, he moved in, started sleeping with everyone at the age of 16. And I'm then... sure they didn't wait till he's 16th yeah. birthday. No. Exactly. So we can imagine. There's no evidence to back that up, but uh, I would imagine. No, they didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. And what 26-year-old or 24-year-old woman goes out their way to have a relationship with a child? Now, the thing is, in what you've got to understand, in the UK, it's legal um, to sleep with people who are over the age of 16. No, you, can, you can have sex at the age of 16. Yeah. The yeah. age of consent. Age of consent. Pre we're, preferably with somebody else at 16. Or... We're, we're talking about, yeah, mor morally... Obviously, it's just wrong, be, just it's, because it's legal doesn't mean it's moral. Yeah. Um. And then we have the criminal drug abuser. Yeah. Jeffrey just, Stewart Lee. Throw and one of them was, into the mix. Yeah. He was twenty-seven at the time. Um. He often stayed there when he took drugs. Obviously, when you're taking drugs, you're too high. You can't do and um, pass out, especially the type of uh, hard drugs that they were taking, because they were taking probably or everything and anything, which again you'll probably hear some of. Um, and he used to go round there to fence, as Lisa was mentioning, he used to sell um, the car parts, you know, pass them on to her. And then they, he's, he's, he, he I think he bro he stole the car. They broke it all down, probably all between them. And then she sold them on to other people. Because yeah. um, they were lovely human beings. Yeah. And guess what, everybody? What? He also was sleeping with Paula McNeely. <laughs> <gasps> So, uh, yeah, I mean, is that what? what is that? Is that part of the, you know, is that the, the way they right, cover so, their rent or yeah. drug money? It was, just, or it was a free for all. So, yeah. so far, just just to keep you in the loop, you've got the woman on the top left is sleeping with everybody. The one in the middle on the top row and the one on the bottom on the top row. We've not even mentioned the other one. She's not sleeping with the, with the one below her. Apparently, because that's, that's, that's her, that's her, that's younger, her younger brother. brother. That's her younger brother. Yeah, but who's who the hell name? knows at this stage? But uh, yeah, she's not sleeping with her brother. But everybody else that she's not related to, she's sleeping with. And her uh, crazy friend, who she's moved in for four doors down, is also sleeping with exactly the same people. <laughs> because that's apparently normal in this house. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, we're not done there. Well, no. there. No. All right. So now we're going to move on to Glenn James Powell. Who you see pictured. And he's on the upper right. He's a handsome chap in the top right corner. Look at him. He was living in the house on and off, but came back often. He was Gene Powell's husband. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she was. Still, she was still married while sleeping with a sixteen-year-old. Everybody husband. else in the whole town. Now they're described as estranged. Well, I would hope so. But they're all. But anyway, but they well, still live together, and they were in a sexual people. relationship. Yeah. I wouldn't call it, I mean, that's not my uh, definition of estranged. If you're still living with your husband and having <laughs> yeah. a sexual relationship, you're not estranged. Just a, no. totally crazy. Glenn Powell, of course, was a drug addict and a criminal. They probably got into this whole car racket together. So basically a top-notch human being right there, right? Um, but he was also, who, but he's also sleeping with Bernadette McNeely. No, Daniel, you made you and he's up. also aware that Why his wife wouldn't sleep with a uh, her best friend's husband. You he's also up. aware that his wife, Jean Powell, is sleeping with the child lover what that moved man. in. Oh, so man. this whole scenario is just so convoluted and weird um, and morally wrong. But there's one more resident 
in this house of hell and insanity. Um, more um, than frequent resident, but he's still there. At, yeah. yeah, Clifford on the bottom left. Which AKA. always makes me think of a big red dog. Yeah. So can we just call him Pook? We'll you call him Pook it? because that's that's basically how he's referred to. So we'll just call him Pook probably from here on out. But, but he, um, he's not a lovely red dog. He's evil. Yeah. So he was the one that introduced Suzanne allegedly to all of this madness like five years earlier. Um, and yeah, he was frequenting the home too because who wasn't at this stage? Everybody was living there. Um, Pook was 17 at this time, at this point, and allegedly wasn't sleeping with anybody. Um, now there are some sources. Bless him. There are some sources that I came across that described him as being a bit slow. Um, but none of this, the fact that he doesn't sleep with anyone allegedly, or the fact that he's slow, makes him any less complicit in or any less evil or and twisted in the part that he plays. No, nothing, nothing um, dismisses it because he'll have a big part in the events to come as well. Yeah. All right. So we've we've uh, met whatever the hell this is. So now we have you guys know who everybody is up there. Yeah. There's not even a word for whatever the hell this is, but uh, yeah, we've met this bizarre Strange sex collection. tryst of evil, drug demonic, den. drug den of criminals. Yeah. Look, just, is there a word, Daniel, for whatever this is? Crap hole. A mess. Bullshit. Hell, hell house. Right. Hell house. Can't get any more. Right, so Jean Powell, up there, yeah, and Bernadette were at this point now abusing Suzanne because they're lovely human beings. Anything that went wrong at 97 Langley Road, no matter how pathetic or petty, was Suzanne's fault in the minds of these two deranged human beings. And therefore, these women punished this teenage girl for everything. She was their literal punch bag. These twisted women enjoyed, they enjoyed this. Now, I'm not just saying that, they actually enjoyed the power that they held over this child. They enjoyed treating her like a slave. They enjoyed using her as a punch bag. And poor Suzanne, who at 16 is still a child, just wanted to belong. She just wanted the acceptance of these two manipulative bitches. Do you think she actually... Sorry. So she put up with it. Yeah. Do you think that she actually... Um was babysitting the children for free, not because of, obviously, to be accepted by the clan, but do you reckon she had felt like the need to, because these these are just letting their, obviously letting their children run loose and neglected, so know. she probably was the only person with any sense and care. I, I, perhaps. I don't know. Yeah, anyway, anyway that's all. <laughs> these twisted women punished Suzanne regularly for <laughs> these perceived transgressions. Punishments would include tying her up, beating her via punches or kicks, and also spitting on her, which is disgusting. Uh, both her sister and her stepfather, although they weren't aware of the extent of what was going on, had urged her to distance her herself from this pair because they didn't want her in this situation, although they did not they did not for a moment realise the magnitude of what was really no. going on or even imagine what was going to happen next. Mm. Uh, what happened behind closed doors, they had no clue. Right. But obviously she was 16, and if you tell a 16-year-old, any 16-year-old, I was 16 once, and I know this to be true for a fact, if you tell a 16-year-old not to do something, you can goddamn guarantee they're going to do it. Yeah. That's just what 16-year-olds do. Because they, they they think they're an adult. They're not quite an adult yet, so they think they know best. But they don't. Anyway, this vulnerable girl thought that these people were her friends also. Um, despite the treatment that they'd inflicted upon her, they still allowed her to stay in their home. And I use the term home very loosely. Oh, yeah, because they're getting everything done for them. Yeah, exactly. It wasn't that they allowed her. They... Yeah. They wanted her there. Oh, yeah. It was a, it was a slave, basically. Mm -hmm. And 
this is just conjecture, pure conjecture here. Suzanne was probably very attached to these six children, whom at this point she was their main caregiver. Uh, these people were uh, away committing crimes, sleeping with each other, having mm -hmm. relationships, uh, taking drugs. She was the main caregiver. She was probably attached to these children. Yeah. Because uh, the parents were too busy doing everything else. Yeah. So that probably ent enticed her to stay. For the children's sake as well, a little bit. Yeah, just my opinion. Safety, probably for their safety. Just, just my opinion. That the, the yeah, children... but you can only you can only take so much, right? Yeah, mm. they, they were a hook. Uh, however, she did appear to have reached a limit in 1992 when she was 16. She apparently tried to tell a neighbour about the treatment that she was receiving at the hands of these two women, but they didn't believe her. Uh, obviously, it sounds a bit unbelievable. I mean, just. Hmm. Anyway, they didn't believe her, so that's a missed opportunity. There's so many missed opportunities in this case. It's tragic, but uh, they didn't hmm. believe her. So this child, and this is a bit that really... This child then decided that there was one person on this earth who would surely believe her and we would surely help her. So she went to them, and she went to her mother. Yeah. And uh, Jamie can go on because, uh, yeah, well, I'm not even. So you can imagine now, so she, she felt she's been stranded, she's been in a situation, she's finally had enough. She's tried reaching out to people like the neighbours. Now, we know it's a sort of close community by the look of it. Why this person didn't believe her, I don't know. You know, perhaps they, they just thought all of them were a bunch of loons. You know, we don't know. So, yeah, like Lisa said, she decided to try uh, some luck with her mum. So uh, she turned up at the door of her mother. Remember, she was covered in bruises. That was visible because they'd been punching her and kicking her and stuff like that. And she asked um, if she could stay, which is strange. Why would she have to ask to stay, first of all? You shouldn't have it should have been like, Mum, I've got to come home because... That place is horrific. Well, you shouldn't have to, at 16, ask your parent if you could stay no. in what should be your house. Yeah. Typically, well. no, but let's not forget that this woman left yeah. her daughters with her ex-husband, their stepfather, and she chose to go on her own uh -huh. way. Uh-huh. So, she's, you know, she's covered in all these um, uh, bruises. Now, obviously, she's in distress, I should imagine, at that time. And guess what her mother did? She refused. Now, there's two versions of why this was. Um, the, the first was from other family members. is because Elizabeth Dunbar had a new partner who did not want um, Suzanne staying with them. The second version is from Elizabeth herself. And, and she says that she was in the mid middle of uh, decorating and preparing a room for Suzanne. And she was due to move in uh, around Christmas, which December, that is around Christmas, if you ask me. But even if a room, now we give her the benefit of the doubt and say, you know, yeah, all right. We'll, we'll, the room we'll was, believe your story, Elizabeth. Yeah. The room was being decorated, so there's paint and, and maybe no carpet or whatever, no flooring. Um, but that was her and child. I mean, they've got a sofa, haven't they? I mean, most people, well, we know, apart from the people apart, out there. Apart from uh, but, uh, Gene Pebble. Seats. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, that's uh, as far as we're concerned, that's total BS. But basically, she turned her away. She yeah. basically turned her away. Um, and and uh, if your child or anybody, somebody yeah. else's child, somebody else's child turns up at your door covered in bruises and begging for somewhere to stay, you don't turn them away. Now, granted, she didn't come out and explain, oh, this is what she was put through, but anybody with eyes would have seen. She needed a place to say this is her daughter, and she's got these marks and bruises on her. Yeah, I can't. I can't even. Uh, I mean, she, how she must have been feeling. But um, yeah, so the, she couldn't put her up on the sofa. I, I probably would probably tend to believe that the boyfriend, because I've known people in that sort of situation where their boyfriend, their boyfriends or new partners or whatever, say no and whatever. I know it goes on, but. Even even sleeping in, in you know on the floor or so, another room, uh, XB said on the floor could have been somewhere. But I'm sure sleeping on the floor would have been a hell of a lot better than what ended up. Um, yeah, um, but there there <clears> you <throat> go. So um, so you can imagine now. So um, 
she's got no one else or she didn't think. And then obviously um, there was someone who did care. Um, it wasn't a biological parent, no, as we just said. But a stepfather, as Lisa said earlier, the stepfather was trying to be as a good father to her as possible beforehand. Mm -hmm. And obviously after, again, she probably got a, a, a bit removed away from him because she was hanging about with these. She was, she thought she was having a good time initially and then, until all this trouble happens and uh, obviously seeing less of him. But um, yeah, so uh, um, I mean, she, um, she stayed, did she go back to them? She did. She, go, she stayed there for a short while. Short while, while yeah. She she was safe and secure. Yeah. With someone we actually give a damn about her. Yeah. Um. But, but it wasn't uh, permanent. Yeah, but unfortunately, just as she was getting settled, um, of course, these two minutes of twisted women had a holdover, and they lost their victim. Oh yeah, that. And they lost their slave. So of course, as you can imagine. They're not going to allow her to leave. Also, you got to imagine what she knows and that what they know, what they've been doing to us so far. So that would be in their benefit to get her back. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So, I mean, while she was absent from that house, uh, which to me was like a house of hell and the whole situation there on Langworthy Road, um, Suzanne was still continuing to be blamed um, for the most ridiculous of things by this evil clan. Um, Jean Powell had lost her new pink duffel coat, which was valued at around 50 pounds for the kid. This is, yeah, I wasn't sure what a duffel coat is. Daddy, but... I said, what the fuck's a duffel coat? <laughs> <laughs> she swore at me. I no, mean, no, no. <laughs> she did. She did. And I had to explain to her what a duffel coat was. Uh, I had a duffel coat. It wasn't pink, and I wasn't 26, but I had a duffel coat. Well, Jean Powell apparently lost this coat, and of course, why not blame Suzanne? Because that's what they like to do. Um, but she probably lost it in a drug and alcohol, you know, induced haze. Yeah. Now, these residents that lived in this uh, number 97 terraced home there, they all got pubic lice, also known as crabs. You can imagine why. Uh, and in, in, their, in their moronic minds, they decided, hey, you know, let's blame Suzanne for this. Even though they've all been sleeping with each other, they're going to blame Suzanne for this. Yeah, it couldn't possibly be the fact that they're sleeping with just, like, everybody. Just because yeah. they probably only had one bed in the whole house. But <laughs> So they needed to manipulate her. They needed to get her back. They decided Suzanne needed to be punished for all of these alleged transgressions. And they dreamed up a little scheme, you know, um, they needed to have her back. And so Jean Powell and said that, or she knew that Suzanne had been interested in this young man, a certain particular young man. And so she got the message to Suzanne that this guy was at her home and wanted to speak to her, Suzanne. And it just so, you know, because Suzanne was interested, this came to her mind like, well, yeah, maybe I'll come check it out. So being 16, you know, we all know we've been there. You, you like somebody, you uh, get excited about that. You've been in love. Suzanne was probably very excited, butterflies in her stomach. She probably took some, some time to pick out just the right outfit, right? The right clothes, put on some makeup maybe, and made her way back to the house, uh, to Jean's house to meet up with him. Except he wasn't there. They lied. Um, and what awaited her was the most unimaginable series of events and the most brutal torture mm. at the hands of these evil. And like Lisa said, calling them human beings just isn't even fair. Um, what awaited her was eventual death. And... Okay, brace yourselves because what we're going to discuss now is more specific and graphic in nature, not visually, but description wise. Um, the next part of the story is beyond disturbing and horrific. Yeah. So they've lured her back, and that's where the next step comes in. Yeah. So when no one 
the 7th of December 1992, and Suzanne, who at this point is 16, arrives at number 97 Langworthy Road. As soon as she stepped in the door, she was ambushed by these pathetic excuses for human beings. They restrained her and took her to the kitchen. They then hacked off her hair with scissors and shaved her head and her eyebrows. This, this is just the first of many things, but this, this act alone is disgusting. They're removing her femininity by removing her hair and her eyebrows. They're taking away her humanity. They're dehumanising her and making her feel worthless. But they were by no means done. No, they didn't stop there. They then stripped her naked and put a bag over her head and paraded her around the house, all the while beating her before taking her to the bathroom. In the bathroom, they then forced the 16-year-old girl to shave her own pubic hair off because this was revenge, because that's something they had to do because they had the crabs. She didn't. But this was revenge. This is... Oh, my God. Yep, they forced her. They forced her to do this. They forced her to shave her own pubic hair. Right. Sorry. This is difficult. Um, they made her feel every ounce of that humiliation that they felt, and then some. All the while, they were beating her, punching her, kicking her, spitting on her, and degrading this terrified child. They then asserted her dominance on her, over her, by forcing her to clean up the pubic hair from the bathroom floor and then go down and clean up the hair that they'd hacked off and shaved off in the kitchen. She was a worthless human being to them. She was a slave, a nobody, just an object for them to abuse. And they were going to make her know that. Yeah. Indeed. Jamie. So, if that weren't enough, what did they do next? Well, Len, of course, as you do, they locked her up in a cupboard overnight. Yep, a cupboard. Now, <clears throat> while she was locked up in this cupboard, remember she's been beaten, she's been stripped naked, she's been shaved, she's been forced to clear up a mess. And then she's been shoved in the cupboard. Um, of course, she cried in the cupboard. She was screaming and crying. She was in pain from the uh, injuries, the humili uh, humili uh, humiliation. humiliation. Humiliation, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, she had to cut off her and hair and things like that, as we said. Um, it was cramped. It was dark. She was alone. She don't know what was going um, to happen to her next. Obviously, she was in there. She didn't know what was going to happen. They, they could decide that she was going to get punished for something else next. Mm -hmm. Now, some things obviously flooded in her head, um, but I don't think she really, really could anticipate and imagine the depravity, the violence, wow. what She's is probably, going to endure in the next coming yeah. days that she was going to encounter. She probably in those hours was contemplating her fate and thinking mm -hmm. about, like, she was probably thinking about how humiliating it would be to be out in public with her hair and her eyebrows shaved Well, off. even that alone, yeah. Especially She's being... Not Oh. And and before Jamie goes on too, just very quickly, you guys, you saw these terraced homes right next to each other, butted up against each other, and all this torture that's going on, and her crying and screaming, and I find it so hard to believe that neighbors. Oh, they would have heard. These didn't neighbors hear. didn't believe her story. They, they would. And then I was going to say that. And then this neighbor that she went to previously, who didn't believe her, I don't know if it was a next door neighbor or not, but. No. I look at I know that at this time period, and then maybe I don't know if it still is or not, but this area was kind of low income. Yeah. But that does not excuse having ethics, morals, compassion. 
I don't know. Go ahead, Jamie. Yeah. I'm sorry. Just before Jamie continues, I live in a terraced house and my neighbor once complained that my cat meowed. So you heard her. You heard her. Okay. I think you can hear a cat meowing, which I've got no control over. Anyway. Yeah. Um, so she was left alone there, naked, afraid, alone. As you imagine, very sore, upset, shocked, whatever. Um, the next day, Su Su's, Suzanne was removed from the cupboard and she was also removed from that property because apparently her crying was disturbing the children. Not that they had anything to do with the, 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 her crying. You know, that was them disturbing the children because it was their decisions to beat her and make her shave and cry. What do they think she was going to do if they shoved her in the cupboard? And like, it just that just reminds me that there's six young children yeah. who probably in like you house, said in this house while they're doing this yeah. and suzanne was attached to them obviously and then you have to you have to think that they were quite attached to her so they were probably very upset at hearing her cry oh they also when, when they paraded around the house naked with a bag on her head where were the children yeah. did, did they see her? Children yeah it's a fear do they maybe they were at school i don't know but we uh, don't know but we know we they were subjected know. to something yeah. but yeah so she was disturbing the peace their peace um they, they decided to move her and um, not just from the cupboard but move her out of the house of course if you remember bernadette had a house yeah just up the road um four houses down the road so um i mean obviously they they decided that they couldn't let her go um, because up the state of her, I mean, you imagine we're shaved now. Well, what are they going to explain that? Well, they would probably try these people, as we hear later on as well. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's what they did. They moved her into the home, but they were not done with Susanna yet, unfortunately. No, so, we're uh, done with her. Suzanne. Suzanne, yeah. sorry. Yeah, Suzanne. So that, like Jamie just said, they moved her down to Bernadette's home, which was just four units down um to number 91 and they tied her to an overturned wooden bed frame it's like the box spring bed you know the bottom part you turn it over and there's wood slats they turned it over and they tied her to that with chains and ropes and cords and this is the actual bed that she was tied to and chained to not only that they had stripped her if you remember and they tied her naked spread eagle now that in itself is horrific because she's completely vulnerable to any possible sexual assault at any time and the things that must have been running through this girl's mind are unimaginable and although there's no reports that any sexual assault actually took place knowing these people and how sadistic that they were i mean it, it may have happened it likely could have happened, but they probably gleaned some sort of sexual gratification just from their actions of having her, displaying her in a vulnerable state and then shaving, the shaving of her most intimate areas. It's just sick. So mm -hmm. over the following days, the cycle of abuse just in the torture just transpired under this roof. Um, some mm -hmm. of the most horrific abuse we've ever seen or researched so far. And still tied to the bed, lying in her own excrement, which is something else that they also went on to punish her for, soiling herself like she had a choice. Um, they deprived her of food, water for days. Um, they put this poor child through absolute hell. And in some reports that we saw or that I read, because she had um, her own excrements and bodily fluids all over herself they put her in a bathtub of... yeah we get to, yeah 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 i'll let you guys go on to that then go ahead Lise. i just can't even imagine no all right just when you thought i couldn't get any worse at one point they put headphones on her and made her listen to the same song on repeat at full volume over and over and over and over this was a rave song that had just not long been released in 1992 
and it was called Hi, I'm Chucky. Want to play by a group called 150 Volts? Now, I'm not going to play it for you if you want to go and look it up. Uh, I we, li we listened to it and yeah. Yeah, it just so, took it's based on obviously hi i'm chucky what play it's based on the little doll out of the child's play movies uh, if you want to go and look it up it, it, it brings it it's very difficult to listen to knowing yeah. what happened um we listened to it on a quite a low volume we didn't have it full blast in our eardrums in our ears, constantly. constantly over yeah. days we listened to it no we didn't even listen to the full thing yeah uh, and it was dementing, mm -hmm. especially with the knowledge that we have, and to imagine this being played to this child while the most unimaginable torture is being carried out, it makes it all the more horrific. So mm -hmm. I'm not going to play it. You can decide for yourself if you want to go and listen to that because it brings it. It brings it's a whole. It brings it to a whole different level because yeah. anytime you think it's about like, it, it's kind of like water torture. It's like water torture, you know, just constantly yeah, this it's, music it's being repeated in there. Audio constantly. torture, isn't it? So, yeah, yeah, it is. So yeah, they're playing this over and over, and uh, Bernadette McNeely used this song to intimidate and scare Suzanne every time this fucking bitch went into that room to torture that girl, she bent down and whispered into Suzanne's ear, Hi, I'm Chucky. Want to play? This indicated to Suzanne that the torture was about to commence. The level of psychosis in these people is so beyond comprehension. And I'm not inferring that she's mentally ill because she was evaluated and she's not mentally ill. She's psychotic evil she's demonic in my opinion they're all yeah. they all are so <clears throat> suzanne was beaten horrifically they pounded on her naked body with glee with glee they enjoyed this they enjoyed the power and control and dominance that it gave them they enjoyed her suffering. They enjoyed doing this in front of each other. It gratified them. They're sick. They were performing for each other. They took a sick satisfaction out of every single moment of this girl's suffering. They beat her with wooden bed slats. They had a large three foot long ornamental wooden fork. I don't know why the Bloody hell, you done one of them, but they beat her with that as well. They put, yeah. cig they put cigarettes out on her face. Yeah, they found burnt, yeah. They degraded her. They called her names. They laughed. And when she got tired or looked like she was going to pass out from the pain or the exhaustion or the hunger or the dehydration... That wasn't good enough for them, so they injected her with amphetamines to ensure that she stayed awake for every single moment. That's just... They wanted her to be present. They wanted her to feel every blow. They wanted her to hear every taunt and to see every injury that they inflicted onto her body. They wanted her to suffer. And they wanted her to know to them how worthless she was when they were the fucking worthless ones yeah there was no mercy at all no no sign of any humanity in these people at all they wanted her awake while they spat on her they wanted her wide awake while they even urinated on her yep yeah these people were beyond fucking evil and I'm swearing a lot, but I can't help it because no, they're no. fucking well, evil. We we kind of half expected this, and uh, I mean, it's, it's, it makes me so yeah. angry. As the days went by, um, the group came to a, a realization that um, they can't let Susanna go. How could they? <laughs> you know, that was one thing doing this, uh, beating her up a bit, and you know, and then then upraising it by 
throwing her in a cupboard, shaving off all her hair, and then torturing her. So we went from beating to torture, basically. Um, so the only way out, well, we all know, unfortunately, how this is going to go. It's that they've decided she's going to have to die. You know, because of course they can't admit to her and, and nothing like this. You know, spineless, evil bastards. Know. Yeah, I can't, I can't do it myself, but yeah, I'll, I'll do it. I'll myself. do it. Yeah. At some point during the week, Pook and Lee called at the house and saw Kappa blindfolded and gagged, tied to the bed. Instead of being disgusted, like any normal human yeah, being would be, and alerting the police. Because if I went into somewhere and saw something, I was like, oh. Even if you don't say nothing like that, and you're going, yeah, make an excuse to leave, and you'll be like, I'm going to need to go tell someone, you know, I've got to go tell someone. No, they didn't. They joined in. But unfortunately, unlike the rest of them, they were disgusted by the smell. Because at this stage, obviously, as um, Lisa said and, and Danielle was about to say, she'd been laying in her own urine, there in urine and and uh, feces for several days. So, what did they do with her then? Well, she was um, placed into a, a bath full of disinfectant, which actually burnt her skin. You remember, she's got all these um, injuries, cuts, bruises, <laughs> abrasions, whatever, and she's sitting in this really heavily um, disinfectant water and and they're trying to bathe her in there it's still injecting her with drugs to keep her uh, awake they won't have to feel yeah. everything and then they're not done yet because they don't want to touch her they put a, they shove a sock in her mouth to keep her from screaming and they actually get a, a yard brush a wooden yard brush that you sweep your you Outside look, uh, a yard, broom. Like, if you're in a is that a broom, broom in America? Broom yard brush. That's what I was trying to think. And uh, they started to scrub her with the brush. So yeah. all her injuries were then got all this disaffected, making her stalk her stinging. But they're also rubbing, grinding rubbing, it in. Yeah, grinding rubbing it, in. it all in, making it even more painful for her. And it was that literally removing her skin to the point that's, that that's how hard they skin. scrubbed her with this brush i mean they've got hard neck thinking that she's dirty and smelly these people who's got crabs sleeping with each other not got nothing. i can't imagine the pain i can't imagine I uh -huh. she was then returned to the bed frame and resecured with the chains and rope um and then this is where it gets really bad you, i mean that's been bad anyway but what does Poop do? Well, what Poop do, he thinks a good idea to grab a pair of pliers. Well, they don't want her mm -hmm. recognized. But he actually told her to open her mouth. So they're not forcing her mouth open. They told her to open wide. Well, they, did, they did have to end up forcing her open yeah. because I'm sure she's not going to. And he said calmly, in a calm voice apparently, <sighs> I'm going to rip your teeth out. So you, you're You've had all this gone. Your defence, you can't do nothing. You're tied you just, to just when bed. you're thinking, what yeah. fucking more can these people put, put me through? Uh huh. So, and uh, so they start to try and remove the teeth. Now, obviously, as you know, if you've had a tooth removed, it's quite difficult. It's not an easy task. You know, uh, it's a very painful task. That's why. You, you know, you have the injections at the hospital. The and doctor, that's when you go to a professional to get it done. And you've seen how they've, they've lent in on you and wiggled it about. And, uh, yeah, added they're more, practically like, yeah. like a knee on your chest. Knee pulling. on your chest, pull on you. Of course, he found this difficult. And, of course, what happened, you know what happened. They didn't come out straight. No, they broke in half. It's... Some came out whole because there was much force. Yeah. That actually flew across the room. Um, he but, got he got two out fully. Yeah, and, and the rest broke several, exposing the nerves. The nerves. Now, you imagine know how painful that is. Uh huh. If you've ever had problems with your teeth and had like one tooth with the nerve exposed, you know how painful yeah. that is. And you don't even know what tooth it is because the pain radiates through your whole skull. Can you even just imagine? No. On top of everything else. Yeah. 
Well, now, the, the, the reasoning for this, I mean, obviously it was part of the torture. Let's be honest. We've seen what yeah. we've, we've heard what they've, <sighs> that they've done so far and what the, how pleasing it was to them. But some of them, some of the reasoning for it was so when they do do the deed, which we know, you know, they'd already they're planning, planning, they're they're planning on killing her. Yeah. Killing her. Of course, they've probably seen probably watched TV some, shows. some shitty TV shows and thought, right. oh, dental records. Dental records. So they think if they're going to rip her teeth out, that they're not going to identify Suzanne. And if they can't identify Suzanne, they won't be able to figure yeah. out who it was then. So, uh, yeah. But of course, they gave up halfway because it was too hard for them. Because you know, I don't know. Anyway, for the entirety of this um, torturous exercise, it said that Pook, McNelly, and Jean Powell were all hanging a ball and laughing their heads off at the, uh, and found this hilarious. They actually found it funny. Was a fucking sick. yeah. I mean, that should have that would have made Susanna felt. Worthless. worthless, scared, pan I mean, she would, must have been in horrific pain. Worthless, helpless. I, I, would, I would like to think that she disassociated herself somehow with even being yeah. where she was at. Even going back to when, like, she's had these these four people doing this to her for a few days before these other two turned up. Yeah. And when these other two turned up, she must have had a little glimmer of hope that maybe they're going to. Stop them! Not, Maybe they're going to stop them, and this this is over. Not all these the, people can be so careless. For them, for them to yeah. join in and then be the ones that start ripping their teeth out. Yeah. What the fuck is wrong well, with people? With some of the stories that we've said so far throughout the episodes, we we would say, how can you imagine this one person? This is a whole group of people, and there's more but getting involved. Yeah, more, you more know, more what, but it, but here's the thing: it's not just them, and this is this is where I have take issue again with the whole neighbors thing because now we're moving on right they've done all this to her they've ripped her skin off pulled her teeth shaved her bodily hair they're gonna move her yet again so let's not forget she's been moved from Paul's home Jane Jean's home over to Bernadette's home apparently no neighbor saw this now they're gonna move her body because they can't kill her there so nobody sees them in this next event, allegedly. But on December 14th, 1992, this... It was very early hours of the morning, but still. Still. This group bundled <laughs> Suzanne's poor mangled body, horrifically injured body, into the trunk of a stolen Fiat Panda. Um, we have a picture of one that looks similar. Uh, it's not the exact... It wasn't their car, but it's... a. Uh, Stolen like, car, that, obviously. Yeah, it wasn't their car anyway, because it was stolen. Yeah, it was stolen exactly. Yeah. But anyway, not all this six of them. Not all six of them. Panda, and Danielle said that was another thing. She went, "What the f is that?" She was swearing at me a lot this week. <laughs> but I, me, wait a minute now, who's doing the swearing? <laughs> also, also uh, on this on the script, I wrote that they put her in the boot, and Danielle said, "What's a It's a trunk. So yeah. It's a boot." That's right. She said the boot of the. It's the boot. It's the boot of the, the car. Trunk, which in this vehicle is incredibly small, as you can see. That's a small right. vehicle. But so anyway, all six of these uh, evil perpetrators didn't go. Um, just four of them went. Uh, Bernadette. I'm sure, if could, I'm sure if they could have fitted in a little tiny car, they would have went. Yeah. Bernadette, Jean, Jean's husband, Glenn, and Anthony Dudson were the ones that went and they drove her to a nearby hillside in Warneth Low, which is like a woodsy, I guess, grassy area near Romley, which was like, it was a, like 15 miles away from where they were here. So they removed her from the car and they threw her down an embankment into a patch of brambles that you can imagine the pain yeah. that she must have just endured into the her already injured body and and they threw her down this right but it wasn't over there they then doused her in in gasoline and petrol and they attempted to set fire to her now one report says that apparently they couldn't get the lighter or whatever it was lit right away and but 
she already knew you could smell. She had to know what was coming, right? And they did actually get the fire going, but it also, it, it didn't, she didn't go up in the flames that they wanted to. It burned out quickly. And so then they reset her on fire, this time successfully. And believing she was dead, they bundled back, they got all back into the car and they drove home. And to top it off, they were singing Burn Baby Burn, the Disco Inferno song. And um, they were singing this while she was burning and on the way home. I mean, how sick are these individuals? Yeah. Before going home, to top it off, they stopped at a party store. They stopped at a store to purchase some alcohol. And this went back. So they needed they needed to get more of that into their system, I guess, and basically have a party to celebrate what they'd just done. Yeah, but it it doesn't end there. And I guess if you want to say that if there's any glimmer of hope, um, you know, Lisa can can explain what happens next. Right, um, that was quite difficult. But not that it's, any of this has been easy. Yeah. Unbeknownst to them, however, and frankly, miraculously. Suzanne was not dead. By all rights, she probably should have been. She had endured more pain and torture than any human being should ever have to. But this young woman was still alive. She was horrifically injured and had burns to most of her body. But she was alive, and when the fire Stop burning, she began moving, dragging herself. Every movement was excruciating, but she kept going, crawling for help, crawling for her life. Despite the pain that she must have been in and the fact that she should, by all intents and purposes, have been dead, she somehow found the strength and the will to keep going, and so she kept crawling. For a quarter of a mile. Quarter of a mile. They left her for dead. Thank goodness they thought that she was dead at that time. Yeah. But how miraculous that she was able to do this. It reminds me of the other story that we did a few episodes ago. I, uh, I just can't. For, for a quarter of a mile. She crawled, including scaling up that embankment that they'd thrown her down. At 6.10am, she was found by a man called Barry Sutcliffe and two colleagues who were on their way to work. And I can't even begin to imagine how horrified they were. Because her injuries were beyond, beyond comprehension. They took her to a nearby property to get help. This property belonged to a couple called Michael and Margaret Coop, who immediately, upon seeing Suzanne, called an ambulance. They described the state of Suzanne's badly damaged body as follows. Both her hands appeared like ash. Her legs were just like raw meat and her feet appeared to be badly charred. Having been deprived of food and water for a week, because this was seven days, seven days, whilst waiting for the ambulance, Suzanne drank six glasses of water, but she was unable to hold the glass herself or have the glass be put directly on her lips because of her injuries. She had to be helped by Margaret Coop. As a testament to how Suzanne was in life, even now, in these moments, she was courteous and thankful. Michael Coop commented that he was struck by how polite she was. 
she was constantly thanking his wife for her assistance and thank you for helping me. <sighs> Margaret Coop said, this is hard. Um, I think Margaret Coop had um, some medical background and it was a natural instinct to want to help somebody and comfort them. Yeah. yeah. Margaret Coop said, <clears throat> I instinctively went to put my arms around her, but she pulled away because she couldn't bear to be touched. Her head was shaved and there were recent not new cuts to her head. She said her face was almost featureless. Her hands were red raw and black at her fingertips. Her legs were red from top to bottom and she couldn't bear anything near her legs. This is so tragic that this girl just wanted somebody to give a shit and care and show her some compassion and love. And finally in this moment, this woman wanted to do that. She just wanted to give her a hug because she saw the state she was in. But these bastards took that away from her as well because she couldn't bear to be touched and feel that human comfort. This is terrible. <sighs> so, by, by all this time, obviously, um, afterwards, Su Suzanne was taken to the hospital where she was at, where she was actually able to identify herself and i mean obviously it's tragic but in one bit of respect of luck i suppose kind of luck i wouldn't i don't know if i'd call it that but obviously at least that so the police can know who did it she was able to name all their attackers she fucking got them she told the attack uh, about the the details of what happened, the abuse that she had suffered. This is how come why everyone knows exactly what went on step by step. And obviously, some of these people did speak afterwards. But yeah, um, but unfortunately, after identifying herself, telling them all what's happened, she did actually fall into a coma because she had. 80% burns. That's without all the other injuries. You know, I don't know if that was unfortunate. I almost think that it was fortunate yeah. because she was fighting. Yeah, I know. I, I just don't feel right saying that. That's the I trouble. Know. I know it's fortunate that they that, that she was able to say that and get these captured, but also, the, you know, she yeah, still she was finally, passed away. But, she was finally free of that yeah. pain, though. Yeah. She was finally at rest and finally free of the pain, and she made sure that these monsters, because that's what they were, um, when we're known first, their identities were known, the endurance and bravery that she showed, and the strength that she, I don't know where she got it from, but she found the strength and she got and, them. And she got them. She I got have my ideas where she got the strength. I'd yeah, say by the strength of God, got her through there. Yeah, she, she got them. She did. The investigation into uh Suzanne's death was led by Detective Inspector Peter Wall of Greater Manchester Police. The best part of the, about this story is what Jamie's about to tell. Yeah, they left her for dead. Like I said, they uh, thought she'd been dead. They had no they clue that she was alive. They thought they got away with it. They thought that I how they thought they got away with it because of you know someone's grasp. But anyway, so they went off partying, didn't they? Yeah, well their party is about to end at least for a while. At seven thirty on fourteenth of December. He instructed officers to attend 97 Langworthy Road and arrest everyone they found there. Jean Powell and McNeely reportedly laughed and joked with each other as they were arrested. So even now, even now, they're still they funny to them because they know what they did, even if they're going to pretend that they didn't do it and things like that. And that is the joke on it. the scene. They couldn't pretend that they were innocent. You know, they're laughing. Well, they couldn't. Uh, actually, that's something that I didn't actually write down that uh, they couldn't pretend they were innocent because when police went into these homes they found the evidence there was evidence everywhere the teeth was, you imagine so yeah, they found the they found 
the pliers with Suzanne's blood on it. They found Suzanne's teeth that had been ripped out of her mouth. They found the hair in the bin outside that they'd made Suzanne clean up. They found her bodily fluids all over this bed frame. Yeah, that was everywhere. Both the houses, ev the evidence as well. was everywhere. Mm -hmm. There was no denying it, yeah. but they still fucking tried. No, they did. Obviously, there's no denying it. But of course, as we know, all these people, they always deny it. No, it wasn't me. Wasn't me. Not me. Yeah, I didn't do it. Anyway, they all denied involvement, as you can imagine. Don't know how, don't know why, but they do. Um, however, under questioning, Dudson, who was urged by his father to actually say, you know, someone with a bit of, um, you know, intelligence said, you know, you're going to have to tell the truth. You're going to have to say something, basically. That, that's what he's saying. He's not really saying, tell the truth, be honest, probably. He's probably saying, you need to save your own ass, right? So, Dodson, Dudson, sorry, Dudson, began to talk. D.I. Wall, Wall said of Dudson's statement, as the story began to unfold, we just couldn't believe it. I kept asking myself, how can one human being could do this to another yet here we are with a bunch of them police officers wept as the extent of Suzanne's suffering was revealed and these police officers have seen some shit yeah yeah they've experienced some horrific things yeah but as yeah but yeah. this so of course what they've done is obviously um the police and the staff oh. at the station they all um, got together and raised uh, some money together. Raised some money for some flowers, so the least they could do. Yeah. They felt they had to uh, do something, so they sent yeah. some flowers to Suzanne in the hospital. And on um, 17th of December 1992, the six accused appeared before magistrates in Manchester and they were remanded in custody, charged with kidnapping and attempting murder following Kappa's death. They were then charged with murder on the 23rd of 1992. So initially... Oh, that was, on the, 20th, that was, a, that was yeah. on the 23rd that they were charged. So Merry fucking Christmas. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, the inquest, it was opened by Leonard Gradkin um, at Manchester Coroner's Court on January 8th of 1993. And Dr. William Lawler, he was a home office pathologist, testified that um, Suzanne Capper had suffered 75 to 80 percent burns over her body, consistent with having um, had gas thrown over her and set on fire, and that her chance of survival would have had been minimal. Yeah. It's um, a miracle that she survived as long as she did. Yeah. Well, he said, he said in his own words, it was clear from the outset that Suzanne was unlikely to survive. She suffered widespread burns that led to several complications internally. So, um, and that her death was due to complications caused by the burns. So the coroner, the coroner offered, um, or he had said, quote, it is clear that this young girl must have suffered a great deal of pain and had no chance of survival. But she did fortunately survive long enough to give information which led to the people mentioned being charged with her death, end quote. Um, he further directed a statement to um, her mother, which... Mother of the year. Well, say the one that gave birth to her and her stepfather, saying that I offer you, not just on my behalf, but on behalf of the whole na nation, my very deepest sympathy and condolences at the tragic happening to your young daughter. I mean, I don't know what else you can say, but just I, yeah, horrific. So that was a newspaper clipping that you see on screen that was um, in the newspaper at that time. The newspaper was The Guardian. Yeah, one of the very few. Uh, yeah. There wasn't a lot of coverage on this. And there should have been. There should really. have been. She, des been. she deserved to be known what she'd done to make sure that these people paid. I can call what happened paid, which I'm now going to get into. Okay. I was just going to say. <laughs> right. The trial commenced on the 16th of November 1993 and lasted 22 days. 
all six defendants and the let me just find these. Yeah, we'll put them back up on the screen because she's about to go through there. Yeah. So you know who's who because it's very complicated because there's that many people in this case, but uh, yeah, there they are. All six defendants denied murder. Fucking really? <laughs> yeah. Well. The evidence is overwhelming, you morons. Mm -hmm. They denied murder. And in their testimonies, each defendant tried to minimise his or her part in the crime and blame the others. As, he, as they always do. Cowards. Yeah. Cowards. Um, yeah. The jury began their deliberations on the 16th of December, 1993. And they took nine hours and 52 minutes to reach their verdicts, which is... I very, think it was is, too long, really. <laughs> no, that's, that's actually very fast. For, oh, right. Like well, to go over all the the evidence, yeah. Six people, maybe. I don't know. I'm, yeah. yeah, I should have took about uh, ten seconds. <laughs> guilty, 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 guilty. Everything. Throw the book away. Never let them out. Done. But whatever it took them, that's quite quick. Apparently, according to uh, some of this, I mean, some of them yeah, take months. weeks, months. But uh, so just under ten hours. Um, well, you normally have retrials. Yeah. Now, so all oh, well, there was there was no getting around this, but. So, Mr. Justice Potts said, Each of you has been convicted on clear evidence of murder, which was as appalling a murder as it is possible to imagine. And now I'm going to tell you the verdicts that were handed out to these demons that you see above me. I can't think of another word, a better word to describe no, there's no. these people. Demons. Right. Jean Powell, top left, 26. Glenn Powell, who is top right, is that right? Yeah, yeah, top right. And Bernadette McNeely, bottom I'm middle, center. were jailed for life for murder. Each received concurrent 20 year terms for conspiracy to commit GBH. That's grievous body. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's grievous bodily harm. As did Glenn Powell for false imprisonment. Anthony Dudson, who is top middle on that picture, was also found guilty of murder and he was ordered to be detained at Her Majesty's pleasure. And Danielle said, what does that mean? The false imprisonment? No, the Her Majesty's pleasure. Oh, yeah. I was like, what is Her Majesty's pleasure? Detained? That's because the prisons are called like HM, whatever. So HN. Okay. Yeah. So Her Majesty, you're detained at Her Majesty's. Or no, we have correctional facilities or prisons here over there. It's called Her Majesty's. Yeah. yeah. So it's HM. There are the name people of the are being okay. imprisoned for on behalf of the Queen, basically. Yeah, apparently, yeah, well, well the King now because the King, it's yeah. the King now, but whatever. Okay. So he received concurrent fifteen-year terms for conspiracy to commit GBH and false imprisonment. Jeffrey Lee, 27, that uh, thing on the bottom there, was jailed for 12 years for false imprisonment. Clifford, the big red dog Pook, who was 18 at the time, was sentenced to 15 years detention for conspiracy to commit GBH and seven years concurrent for false imprisonment. Because if you remember, two of them, those two didn't go. They, were, they weren't in the car, so they, they didn't weren't in the car to set her on fire. Yeah, they ripped her teeth out, and what, but they didn't get done with murder. Um, as the sentences were announced, two of the jurors were in tears, and there were cries of yes from the public gallery, which was filled with people that knew Suzanne. In a statement to the press after sentencing, Detective Inspector Wall said, psychological reports say that these are absolutely sane individuals. It's frightening that they are such ordinary people. There is nothing special about any of them. But there's a special place in hell for them, I'm sure. Absolutely. But Expialidocious made the statement there, life should mean life. Yeah. And you no, are okay. correct, especially yeah, okay. in this incident. They didn't have the death penalty, but you would hope that they'd stay there for life as well. Yeah. yeah. And Jamie's now going to tell yeah, you. Jamie. 
See, that's that's the thing. If you, if you, I don't know if you're aware of the UK justice system, but that's that's that's, that's yeah. quite bad, really, with people getting out. Because basically, when you get sentenced in the UK, you can life that. life generally means twenty five years. Now, how they think that twenty five years equates to a life, I have no idea. You should take maybe the average life expectancy of a human. <laughs> I would imagine, yeah. but life means 25 years, but when you get sentenced to 25 years, you only serve half, so you're, you're probably going to do about 12 and a half years. The most, that is. At the right. most. Yeah. If, you, if you've if got good behaviour, you could be out in even half of that and be out in six so, years. So, let's have a look at that. That's how shit it is. So, yeah, let's imagine. imagine. To the reprobates. So, uh, yeah, so it's now 2023, and guess what? They're all free. They're all free. I think one of them might still be in prison, Apart but I one. couldn't find out about him. Yeah, I believe there's one what was still. He, he was but... he was still in prison as far as 2019, yeah. early 2020. There was mention of him, but coming. I couldn't find out if he's got out in the yeah preceding three now, years. So McNally's sentence was reduced by one year in 2013 and was paroled in 2015. So she got out in 2015. Okay. Um. Mm-hmm. Lee's sentence was reduced from 12 to 9 years in November 1994. He was released in 1998. Disgusting. Dudson's minimal tariff was cut to 16 to 18 years in 2002. He was released in 2013. Pook was released in May 2001. In 2017, Jean Gillespie, formerly Powell, was released. Jean Powell changed her name to Jean Gillespie. So she's yeah. Jean Gillespie now. I said Gillespie, didn't I? Gillespie. You said yeah. Jamie. Like, it weren't as bad as earlier. You yeah. want to hear what he called her earlier when he went down. Yeah. So these people are now free. Um, now, whilst in prison. Oh, yeah. McNeely had an affair with the prisoner governor. No wonder that they. Were re- released for good behaviour and stuff. Yeah. Anyhow, Mike Martin and so uh, and was released early because she had good behaviour. Like she's sleeping with the governor. Of course, he's he was also married. Yeah. She's sleeping with the governor of the prison. So, so and then she gets released for good behaviour. So of course he's gonna write a report. Oh, she's done very well, you know. Well, yeah. Well, I've got it's... something to say about that as well afterwards. Um. She also had a relationship whilst in prison with a fellow prisoner. Now, some of you may know this name. UK will definitely know. Yeah, and it's probably something they're... that we're going to cover. We will cover yeah. later because it's disgusting as well. She had apparently had a relationship in prison with Myra Hindley. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, Myra Hindley is one of the UK's most um, prolific child killers, female. Is, um, child yeah, killers. Together with Ian Brady, they murder children. It's called the Moors Murders, and it's something that we will yeah. cover at some point. Uh, and she's done some heinous things. <sighs> uh, but they they called her a model prisoner. I mean, of course they're going to call her a model prisoner. This is what really we saw this a couple of episodes ago when we said, well, they can't do the things that they do wrong out of prison. That's the whole point of prison. Yeah. Some do. Like they've not got no, and they do know how to work. They know how to work the system, literally. Exactly. Yeah, they've not got access to the things that they actually... Yeah. They've not got access to children. So, that, so they're not going to commit the crimes that they committed against children while they're in prison. So I don't give a shit if they behaved while they were in they prison. They fold up the clothes, they didn't have, as we said They didn't before. have access to the things that actually yeah. these sick, but, twisted freaks take but, pleasure in doing. Yeah. But it gets even worse. Yeah, oh, well... Uh, okay, well it's, go ahead. it's go ahead. ridiculous. It gets real ridiculous. Just when you thought you could go yeah. back in the water and it was so, safe. So she slept with the, the, the governor, obviously, to get out. Um, she slept with Myra Hindley or had a relationship, whatever that means, in prison. Um, and then imagine. she moves out. She gets set free. And where does she go? Yeah, Where does she move? Out of all the places in the world. She moves in the same block. We say block, block of flats. Block of block, flats. You know, the um, just to, apartments. Just to prove okay. it. Right. She made a very good friend while she was in prison, yeah. so she chose to move to exactly the same block of flats as this person that she made. Who was it? And that person is Car- uh, Karen Matthews. Karen Matthews! Who's Karen Matthews? Karen Matthews? Oh, my God. Yeah. Karen Matthews. Right, really quickly. 
very quickly tell who Shannon Matthews' daughter, Shannon Matthews, went missing, apparently. And there was a whole thing all over the media. They were looking for this little girl. She was missing. Uh, went on for weeks. The whole community was looking for her. This was in, uh, I think it was Liverpool. I'm not quite sure. I have to check. Uh, Karen Matthews was having an affair with somebody else. Not She wasn't with Shannon's father. It's very convoluted as well. She, fa she basically faked. She faked she the faked, kidnapping. She faked the kidnapping. They found Shannon in her boyfriend's house, Drug drugged up. up under a divan bed frame. So she's faked. So that she can fundraise because she'd seen how much money was fundraised for like for Madeline, McCann. Madeline McCann, for example. Yeah. She'd faked her own daughter's kidnapping and had this man drug her up and put her under the bed frame for days and days, well, like over a week. I think. Oh, this is who McNeely. This is the kind of people that they're know, associating with. It's company yeah. with. And, and uh, I mean, Karen Matthews now, even when she got out, she. She was making friends and uh, uh, and with some dodgy people that was, is well known from history. And also, she then went with a man called Paul Sanders, who was convicted of um, child sex offenders yeah. in 2000. That's a partner. So they never change. Let's be honest. They never change. So really. can you imagine that in this block of flats? Yeah. Picture this. You've got Karen Matthews, who had her own daughter drugged and imprisoned under a bed so that she could fundraise. Well, she like went on the news and cried and pretended that she wanted her daughter back. She knew exactly where she was. You've got her new partner, who is somebody that's been convicted of child sex offences, and you've got Bernadette. Bernadette. Bernadette, well. who had done what she done, what we just talked about to Suzanne, all living in very close quarters, which is very similar to what happened in 1992 on this street where Bernadette lived next to Jane, and look what happened. These people should not be allowed to associate with each other because it, it could literally all happen again. With that, with that mixture of people all together again. Just keep your children away from these people. Absolutely. Yeah. It's it's so scary to think about this actually being reality, that this actually happened. So there were so many missed opportunities here. Uh, so many things that could have changed. It just so happens that two of these guys worked on and helped Suzanne Capper's sister, Michelle, her fiance had a vehicle or a car that needed to be fixed. And these two guys at the same time that Suzanne was being held. Well, she was being held. Yeah. They were fixing it. I mean, that, that was just one. Well, opportunity. They, went, they went to help him fix his car and didn't say a word. And that, that, brother-in-law was quoted as saying he'd like 10 minutes with her now to, with them now you know yeah. had he known obviously he anybody in their right mind would have done something to change the circumstances but um there were so many missed opportunities to save suzanne and to spare this unimaginable torture that she endured from the from the local authorities intervening more so that more so than they did um to her mother well, they'd been in the care system, so, so where was the follow-up? Yeah. Where was the, the follow-up? But had okay, but then it, the follow-up, the care system, had her mother allowed her to stay with her that night? Yeah. Um, you, you know, seeing her bruised and battered child turning up at her door desperate for help. Um, to any one of the six individuals, had they had any kind of semblance of a conscience or to be able, I mean, this is what blows my mind. I, you know, so you got one or two psychos. You got Jean and you got Bernadette, right? Mm -hmm. No, you've got four other people. Total of six people that went in on this, and not one of them yeah. stopped. Not one of them and, stopped. And when, like we mentioned before, there was a lot of people, a lot of traffic going in and out of that home. Yeah, people must have been more people that knew. Well, it was also later discovered that um, a neighbor had also had the opportunity to save her. Uh, David Hill, he was 18 years old. He had heard her crying and he'd inquired as to, he went over there, like, what's going on? What's the noise from? And this, well, the neighbor, group, this just proves that the neighbors were hearing things. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and this group just proudly, they showed him Suzanne bound and gagged on that bed. And then left the house alone i mean he could he could have they, they left him in the house they, they left her in the house yeah but 
and she she begged him she apparently begged him to help but he was too scared you know thinking maybe they were going to do this to him um no so shit. He, i'm sorry that's not good enough yeah if you'd, so, done, if you'd done something if you'd found the place got any help yeah you don't have any reason to be so scared he, he just sat there. they would have been arrested yep so he just sat there, I mean, because he was left alone to keep an eye on her. Because the, the other ones left her like, okay, we're going to leave you, David Hill. You know, keep an eye on her. Don't let anything. And that's when she did her begging and everything. Well, he didn't. I'm sorry, David Hill. That's a shit excuse. Yeah. So when he he stayed with her until they returned. And then he just left and kept his, kept his mouth shut. Now, why wouldn't you? So if you're scared that they're going to do this to you while you're there, why don't you then go home yeah, when later you leave. and put in an anonymous phone call? Do it when you leave. Yeah. Well... The, the, well, I, I think this is a different case, but I mean, obviously, we've seen before where people have said things and people in the police or whatever, or the authorities, and done sufficient. Uh, that's why they get out. But this would have been dead right. He knew that that would have been a done deal if he did. So Absolutely. Let's... And it could have been anonymous. He, you know, he didn't yeah. have to, you know. So now, many missed opportunities. Now, her mother, her mother, um, during this whole week that she was being held and abused and tortured, she assumed that Suzanne was with the stepfather and the stepfather assumed the opposite. Yeah. The opposite. Or, or at least didn't assume he, he may have known that she he was whatever the case. She never checked. She never once thought that she should speak or have contact with her child or contact the stepfather and say, Hey, how oh. is Suzanne doing? Is she okay? Is she with you? She came to my house battered and bruised how is she doing now um she but no, the time she's too busy decorating so no one knew or had any idea that where she was or what was happening to her which is really sad tragic absolutely tragic all right it also highlights the absolute let me just get rid of them because I'm sick looking at them now. So, uh, bye bye. We got the flowers and the the. Yeah, I'll get them in a minute. Yeah. I've just closed it now. Twat. Okay. Um, it also highlights the absolute inadequacy of our in the UK, and it's probably the same everywhere in the world. We've seen other cases like what we've seen in Canada, where the mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, great right. bus. Yep. It shows the complete inadequacy of the criminal justice system that six people could commit a murder with such blatant disregard for human life that they could torture a child and enjoy it and ever be free in society again is completely incomprehensible. Mm -hmm. These people are not fit to ever be in society. They are broken husks. I'm not going to call them human. I'm going to call them broken husks because they've got zero humanity. Mm -hmm. Nothing, nothing can take away what they did. They not only took Suzanne's life, they took away her femininity. They took away her humanity. They took away her dignity. They stripped away her sanity. They completely physically and psychologically destroyed this girl in every way imaginable and even every way unimaginable. And yet they all now have their lives back. They all get to taste freedom. Temporarily. They all, well, yeah. They all get to live and they're all apparently reformed, which I think is bullshit. They've apparently learned the lesson. They're apparently changed. I personally don't think that you can reach the complete and utter depths of depravity and evil that it took for them to do the unspeakable things that these demons did to that child and then feel any semblance of sorrow or remorse or guilt or shame. They've not got it in them. I just don't buy it. Seven days. Seven days, that's 168 hours. That's 10,080 minutes that they felt no remorse, guilt or shame. Not one of them. They took pleasure in every single second. They laughed, they joked, they had fun. 
that degree of broken is completely irreparable as far as I'm concerned, and no amount of incarceration is ever going to fix that. They should never have been free to mm. walk the streets again. Mm -hmm. Never. In my opinion, don't come for me. There are not enough sorries. I don't even know if they've said sorry, but if they did, no fuck you. But I there are not enough sorries in the world to take away what they did to this girl. There's not enough sorries to take away what she endured at their hands. And it's not society's place to forgive them or put up with them. Only God can judge these people. And I, for one, think that when the time comes that he's going to judge them all the way to the fucking gates of hell. And maybe, maybe just then they'll get a little tiny bit of a feeling of how Suzanne felt when they set her body on fire while they're burning in the fucking pits of hell because that's where they belong. Well, I hope it just turns back tenfold, you know, at least. Yeah. I, uh, they, they, that is where they belong. They can't change. I mean, we're not talking about, like, when you get some of these other cases, where, again, what we spoke about, some of these people say, oh, well, I'm sorry, I'm different and things like that. And, and most of that is BS, as we know. Yeah. But some people do kind of reform because they... they but these these people are not going to reform because they ain't got the different mindset. They ain't got the the means to change because that's their mindset. That's how they are. They they were in their own minds and in the evaluations they were normal. This is their normal behaviour, and we we know that even when they were getting arrested, they were laughing. So that doesn't even compute. Doesn't even compute. It just it, it comes down to that these people were not they weren't human, and I was using the term almost. Um, possessed but lisa it was right in saying so we don't want to use that as an excuse or you know yeah say that they did this but this yeah, is I, the I, end of... we had a discussion about this for yeah danielle said that, that oh they're obviously possessed by a demon i don't like the, what i said i don't like when people say that because when you when you say oh they were, they were possessed by a demon you're putting the onus of what they done on another the demon. entity. It's like yeah. they're not responsible. The, the person responsible is well, another entity. To yeah. me, they are the demon. They they are the demons. They're definitely responsible. And they invited this kind of thing into their lives. They really did. Yeah. yeah. I they, mean, they, they are the demons, and the responsibility and lies solely on their shoulders. The media like no. to try and blame the movie, the horror movies. There was this big thing at the time. Well, yeah, yeah. Because, the, because of the song it was played, and that's rubbish. That's rubbish. Because like we said before. Now, everyone's watched horror movies. A lot of people watch, not everyone, but a lot of people watch horror movies, and it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Yeah. yeah. So, um, it it just so happens that Bernadette did go on and change her name, and I, I I'm sure the other ones did too. I mean, of course they are ignorant people, but Bernadette herself, she changed her name, and uh, she went by Bernie Gardner. Uh. Yeah. Now, recently, there there is, and I'll leave this up to you guys. I don't know what's come of it. There is a Facebook page out there. It's called UK uh, Pedos Exposed. And mm. Pedos is spelled P-A-E-D-O. Because that's how you spell it, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> Over yes, in the UK. I can spell that no, simpler, that's how you spell it, Daniel. Um, I did, uh, I, they do have, but there is a page, a Facebook page, where they show images of what she looks like now and everything. Yeah. Not that, not that it matters. It's the, the whole thing that matters is these people are free out on the streets uh, now. Granted, they're going to get what's coming to them. I think we all know that. But the fact that this happened to such an innocent young lady, who uh, was just the beginning of her life, who was this. Everybody knew her as this polite young girl. She was good in school. Quit school to just be loved and gave money that she earned over and tolerated some of this abuse to begin with because she had, it made her feel somehow accepted, obviously not knowing the extent of what was going to happen to her. Yeah. And I just, I... I have no doubts that she's, you know, she's obviously at peace and it's just, it's, it's a very tragic end, yeah. end to her life. Yeah. Now this, this was a very difficult one and uh, thank you very much for those that stayed with us. Uh, this is, this is Suzanne's legacy. She was a tough little cookie and she, 
she gave everything to make sure that these people were brought to justice, even though slight injustice there in the end. But they they paid some punishment. They, they, they'll pay the rest. They will pay the rest when the time comes. Uh, but this is her legacy. Uh, she shouldn't be forgotten. Mm -hmm. She was a beautiful young girl who was failed in so many ways. Yep. So many ways. And mm -hmm. she did not deserve even a fragment of what happened to her. So this episode is dedicated to Suzanne Capper and may she rest in peace because by God, she's earned that peace. She has earned it more than anybody that I have ever come across. Yeah. Amen. And uh, we will be back next week. We're not doing true crime next week. We'll be looking into a little bit of a mystery, I believe. Uh, and Dan Danielle's taking the wheel on this one. So we're... Uh, we're not going to tell you. It'll be a surprise. It'll be a surprise. <laughs> but uh, Danielle has chosen the topic, and we're going to get into something a little bit mystery history. A little bit different. So uh, we shall see you next Tuesday. Yeah. See, I'm going to say it this time because Danielle has managed to stay the same colour for this entire episode, <laughs> and we're going to give her, give her one, give her just this yeah, one. But uh, she'll be back to her own little Michigan mood ring self next week. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Thanks for joining us. Please yeah, uh, don't forget to like and subscribe and share. And uh, we appreciate your support. So, yes, uh, rest in peace, Suzanne Capper. Yeah. yeah. Rest in peace. Goodbye. See you Bye, later. everybody.